Hi everyone, I'm back today with another video and it's an AQA specific video so if you're any of the other exam boards please don't waste your time watching this. However for AQA people I thought it was important I made this video because there's quite a lot in your new spec and the communicable, I think I'm pronouncing that wrong, diseases chapter, chapter 5 has a lot in it so I wanted to go through that with you. By the way, sorry for my gym attire, I'm just about to go to yoga but I thought I'd best start this video before I went. Right, so I'm going to be going over key definitions like pathogen, what health means, how pathogen entry is prevented by both plants and animals, what happens when they get inside us, and different examples including viruses, protoctis, and bacterial diseases. So it's going to be quite a lot in today's video. So I've made some notes because the chapter in the book was quite hefty and I needed to break it down to help me out. Right, so first of all we're going to define health. Now health is the state of both physical and mental well-being. A lot of people just think it's stuff which affects you like when you get, I don't know, diarrhea, vomiting, but actually it's your mental well-being too that is so important. So what sorts of things might contribute to ill health? Things like stress, things like poor diet, so if you're not taking in enough vitamin D, enough calcium, enough iron, for example, and other factors which you can't control, such as your gender. So obviously men will get prostate cancer, girls won't because we don't have a prostate. Women may get breast cancer. Men can get breast cancer, but very rarely because obviously they have less glandular tissue there. Things like your ethnicity. So um, there's a selection pressure for um, sickle cell anemia in African countries. So things like that will actually affect your ethnicity, may affect how likely you are to get a certain disease. Right, moving on then, so key, key definition of a pathogen. Now, a pathogen is something like a virus, like a bacteria, and your definition is that it's a microorganism which causes disease. So try and get that definition sorted in your head because I'm going to use the word pathogen an awful lot now and it's important you know what it means. Um, crucially, know the difference between bacteria and viruses. Now, bacteria cells are quite big. They infect our bodies. They produce toxins and poisons that make us ill. Viruses are much smaller, they're not technically alive because they're so small, they're just a protein coat with a bit of DNA in them and what happens is they infect your cells and then they actually hijack your cells machinery to get the cell to work exactly as the virus wants them to, whereas the bacteria is self-contained cells. So if you're asked for like just some really small differences, you want to say that viruses are non-living and they're smaller, bacteria are larger and they are living. Okay, a more straightforward question now is how are pathogens spread? So you can use your common sense here. Think about all the times you got ill and why that might have been. So you could say droplet infection, and that's when someone sneezes or coughs on you, so keep those people away because they're disgusting. Some food and some drink will have a bacterial load, so something like under, undercooked chicken will have salmonella in it. Um, some infected water may have cholera in it. So again, be careful with what you're eating. Make sure it's not undercooked and make sure the water you're drinking is clean. I mean, in a country like Britain, you're fine drinking tap water. Some other countries, you need to just drink bottled water. Obviously, there are things like STIs, so sexually transmitted diseases. They will be transmitted through direct bodily contact. And then the stuff like drug users sharing needles, that will help transmit things like hepatitis. So just be aware of all the different ways in which pathogens may be spread. Next up, we need to look at Petri dishes. This is a really bitty video, but I've just gone through the textbook. So remember, a Petri dish is a little plastic dish which we use to grow bacteria on because we're interested in that bacteria, how it grows, and how we can actually prevent its growth using antibiotics. But in terms of preparing a Petri dish for inoculation, first of all, you need to get an inoculating loop, which is just a metal loop that you effectively swab the bacteria onto but you first of all need to disinfect that loop to make sure there's no bacteria pre-existing on it and you need to dip it into a blue flame of a Bunsen burner again to ensure that it's totally sterile. At this point you're going to swab it on the bacteria sample that you're interested in and you're going to wipe it across the agar jelly that's inside your petri dish. Now the agar jelly is a nutrient medium which means that it's full of food that the bacteria can feed on. At this point, you're going to place the lid on the Petri dish and you're going to just make sure that some air can get into that Petri dish to allow the bacteria to aerobically respire. This is quite a high level video, I'm realising this now. Um, and then you want to seal it with tape just to make sure that nothing spills. And that is how you're going to set up your inoculation and your Petri dish. 
Another small weird point, which was also on the old AQA spec, is the role of Samuel Weiss. Now he was a scientist, I think he lived in the 1800s, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. And what was the important thing about him was that he recognised the importance of hand washing. Now before that, doctors would just go between ill patient and ill patient, covered in blood and gore, and go in, and if they were helping with a the childbirth, they'd be there with their hands and everything, and they'd be transmitting these diseases, these pathogens, from one woman to the other. Samuel Weiss was amazing because he realised, no, 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 you should not be doing this. Wash those hands, get rid of that bacteria that stuck to your hands and you will not kill these women. So he was an incredibly important guy. Now we're going to look at how pathogens spread may be prevented and it links with Samuel Weiss. So obviously hand washing is key. Guys, wash your hands after the toilet. I don't know about you, I freak out so badly in public bathrooms that I actually can't cope. So I flush the toilet with my elbow or with a piece of tissue. I open the door with my elbow if I can. It stresses me out if you can't. And then when I'm actually leaving the bathroom having washed my hands, I always like hold the lowest or highest part of the door because I assume that everyone else just uses the middle. Probably everyone does that, so I'm just totally infected, but I really freak out with um, public bathrooms. Ugh. Anyway, so yeah, you want to hand wash, you want to use disinfectant, you want to do stuff like sneezing into tissues, I know it sounds obvious, but don't go sneezing into your hands and then touching stuff, that's absolutely gross. And other things you can do when you're cooking is you can separate your raw and your cooked meats. You definitely shouldn't have raw chicken touching cooked ham, not a good idea because those pathogens will spread and make you very ill indeed. Next up we are going to look at various different examples of viruses and we're going to look at some protoctists and you can call them protists, I think. I think protists might be easier. So yeah, we're gonna start with the measles virus. So make sure you know that these diseases are caused by viruses and you might have to specify that. Now, 100 years ago or something, measles was a very dangerous disease. It caused this huge rash, flu-like symptoms, and actually lots and lots of people died. However, since then, they've developed a measles vaccine, which means that almost no one dies from measles virus anymore. So that's really, really, Good. Next up we've got HIV. Now HIV is a very famous disease. It stands for human immunodeficiency virus and what happens is it's spread by sexual contact. Um, it can be spread from mother to baby through breastfeeding and what happens is you start with flu-like symptoms and then over time it turns from HIV into AIDS and it when AIDS occurs, what you're doing is you're suppressing your immune system because what happens is the virus affects all your white blood cells and stops them functioning properly so they can no longer fight disease. So actually you die from a whole load of extra like diseases that you catch more easily as a result of being infected with HIV. So yeah, not a good disease to get at all. Next up we're going to look at tobacco mosaic virus, which I think I already mentioned. This is a disease which affects plants, it causes discoloration of the leaves and it actually reduces the amount of chlorophyll available. Now remember chlorophyll is found inside chloroplasts and what it does is it reduces the amount of photosynthesis that takes place and as a result that means less glucose is made which means less amino acids, proteins and cellulose can be made and also it means there's less glucose available for respiration so less energy is made. So tobacco mosaic virus, not a good thing. Now we're going to look at some bacterial examples, so I'm talking about salmonella. I already said that you get that in undercooked chicken, particularly raw eggs sort of thing. You get really bad diarrhea and vomiting. I think anyone that's ever had salmonella poisoning really knows about it. And it is a bacterium and you do find that most chickens are vaccinated against this disease these days because it is such a nasty thing to catch. Now we're going to talk about gonorrhea, which is a very hard bacterial name to spell, and that is an STI, which means it's a sexually transmitted disease. And you get some really horrible symptoms with gonorrhea. You get discharge, and you need to know this, from both the penis and the vagina, and you will also find that there's pain when urinating, which means when weeing. Now, this did used to get treated very effectively using antibiotics such as penicillin, but more recently, the bacteria has become very resilient to um, the penicillin, so we're finding that that's less effective, which is quite worrying because it's going to be hard to get rid of it. You need to use barrier methods such as condoms to prevent the spread of gonorrhea. Rose black spot is something else they've mentioned, which I know absolutely nothing about. Apparently it's a fungal disease. As the name suggests, it causes black spots 
on leaves and those black spots will mean that there's less chloroplasts, less chlorophyll and therefore less photosynthesis. So everything I told you about the tobacco and mosaic virus applies here. So you'll have less glucose made, less amino acids being produced, less cellulose and less respiration. So just make sure you're clear with that. And that was a fungal disease. We're moving on to our prototist. Protoctist. Oh my God. Proto protist. <sighs> ah! disease now which is malaria remember that's spread by mosquitoes and it's the female mosquitoes which come along they bite you and actually when they bite you they infect you with malaria now malaria kills millions hundreds of millions of people it's a terrifying disease and it damages both your liver and your blood and it sometimes can affect your brain now the way in which you prevent the spread of malaria is actually by preventing those mosquitoes from biting you so that could be wearing insect repellent or using mosquito nets or draining water sources which are stagnant, but I think that's more of a geography answer. Whew. Right, I think we're done with the different types of diseases. So now we're gonna look at how disease entry may be prevented. This is nice and straightforward, and there's lots of different ways. So first of all, the skin, the largest organ in the body, acts as a barrier. Secondly, you have stomach acid. Now I know that the pathogen has to have entered your body to actually reach that stomach acid, but it hasn't actually been detected by your body yet, so it hasn't actually made you ill. So yeah, the hydrochloric acid kills pathogens. That's all you need to say for that point. Nose hairs trap pathogens, your third point. And lastly, the cilia in the trachea, they trap the pathogens and waft it up to your throat where it can be swallowed and destroyed by stomach acid again. So those are the four ways in which pathogen entry is prevented. Right, next up we're looking at once those pathogens have entered the body, what happens in order to actually destroy them and once they've made us ill, how do we actually stop them making us ill? Because after all, most of the time we're not ill for weeks and weeks on end. And that's all due to your white blood cells. Because first of all, you have white blood cells which engulf the pathogens, which effectively means that they eat them. So you write they engulf pathogens, second type are called lymphocytes and they produce antibodies and they recognize the antigens on the pathogen. You need to look at my white blood cell video if you're not understanding this. And they produce antibodies which destroy the pathogen and they also produce antitoxins. I'm gonna write this, I think, because it's quite confusing. Right, next up, how do vaccinations work? So remember, if you go to some tropical country, you may need to get a vaccination. And all that's happening in this case is a dead or weakened form of the pathogen is injected into your body your lymphocytes produce lots of antibodies against that pathogen. And what happens therefore is the next time you go to the country or whatever, you get infected, well, you've already got a massive store of antibodies ready to attack them. So you can't actually get ill in the first place. So that's why vaccines are so important. Oh, AQA, why is it so random? Oh, they're now wanting us to discuss aphids. Now aphids are little green insects. And what they do is they bite into the phloem of a plant. Now a phloem is a tube which transports sugars around the plant. So obviously they bite into that phloem to access the sugar so they can feed. So what issues does that cause? Well obviously there's less glucose available, so less respiration can take place, less amino acids can be made, less protein and less cellulose. So they do cause a lot of damage. Define chloriosis, that's just the yellowing of leaves due to lack of magnesium ions. You do need to know the the reason why plants need magnesium. Plants need magnesium to make chlorophyll. Plants need nitrates in order to make amino acids and protein, and they may very well ask you that. Next up, how may plant diseases be treated? So we may use pesticides, which obviously kill pests such as aphids. You can use antifungal treatments to destroy things such as black spot on roses, and obviously you could cut away the diseased areas. So yeah, we're gonna use fungal treatments, we're gonna use pesticides to kill aphids, and you're gonna cut away the diseased areas. How may plant diseases be identified? Well, you can send them off to the lab, or you can use home testing kits, which contain monoclonal antibodies, and I'm gonna make a separate video on those bad boys, because they are also really hard. The last two things I wanted to cover is how plants actually prevent invasion by pathogens. Now, lots of different ways. The first of all, they have a waxy cuticle, which prevents pathogen entry because it's very waxy, it's very thick and pathogens find it hard to cross. Next up, lots of trees have thick bark and obviously thick bark is very difficult to get through. You have cellulose in the cell wall which I've already mentioned a lot and that actually strengthens the plant cell and again helps prevent pathogen entry. 
Another thing that plants do is they'll produce poisons and toxins and lots of chemicals which make them very unappetizing and make it difficult for the pathogens to actually affect them. The last thing I wanted to mention is that plants have this clever thing where, is, where deciduous trees lose their leaves in autumn and the great thing about that is if there's any pathogen which has been infecting the leaves it means that they actually drop those leaves in autumn and therefore they lose the pathogen as a result. Lastly, oh my goodness, video is going on and on, is how do plants prevent animals eating them? Because remember herbivores are animals which just eat plants. So plants will make themselves very unappetizing to these animals by growing lots of thorns, lots of hairs, which are very uncomfortable and unpleasant to eat. And they do something called mimicry, which is they'll actually copy the leaf pattern of a more poisonous plant, so the animal's scared to eat the plant in case they get poisoned. So that's a really clever way in which the plants will prevent eating. Uh, and lastly, something like mimosa. If you've ever touched mimosa when you're on holiday, it's a special leaf that when you touch it, it curls up and looks really thin and unappetizing and unappealing and plants will actually shrivel up and curl away and animals can't bother to eat them because they think there's no plant to eat. Right, oh my goodness, that was long. Okay, I'm gonna attach the past paper question now so you can look at the sort of questions I'll ask. Hope you liked this video, guys. It was a mammoth video to film. Don't forget to sub, bye. So tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, is a disease affecting plants. Figure one shows the leaf infected with TMV. We have yellow patches where TMV has destroyed chloroplasts. All tools should be washed and disinfectant after using them on plants infected with TMV. Suggest so why. Use your common sense here. Why do we use disinfectant? Well, it's to kill stuff. So what would we want to kill? Well, we want to kill the TMV because if you have it on the tools and you end up touching another plant, you'll end up infecting that with TMV. So that will be a nightmare. So the most straightforward way of getting this mark is to say to kill the TMV virus or to stop the virus from spreading. Scientists produced a single plant that contained a TMV resistant gene. Suggest how scientists can use this plant to produce many plants with the TMV resistant gene. This is looking at a different part of the spec, it's to do with tissue culture. Because remember with tissue culture you can get a small part of a plant, pop it in growth medium, give it lots of hormones and it will develop into hundreds of new plants all resistant to TMV. So just state here tissue culture. Some plants produce fruits that contain glucose. Describe how you would test for the presence of glucose in fruit. Another part of the spec then, so food tests, how do we test for glucose? Well, first of all, you have to heat it with Benedict's reagent. And then remember that the Benedict's turns from blue to orange or brick red in the presence of glucose. So make, it, make sure you're giving a very clear method here. TMV can cause plants to produce less chlorophyll. This causes leaf discoloration. Explain why plants with TMV have stunted growth. And that's worth four marks. So you want to make four separate points and make sure you're being very scientific here. So let's first of all look at what having less chlorophyll would mean. Remember chlorophyll is found inside chloroplasts and chloroplast's role is to photosynthesize. So you want to say that less chlorophyll means that less photosynthesis will take place. This means that less glucose will be produced. Now why is glucose needed? Remember glucose is needed in respiration. So less respiration will take place meaning that less energy will be produced. Secondly, you need to talk about what glucose is actually used for. So the fact that there's less glucose means that less proteins, amino acids, will be made, as well as less cellulose for cell walls. So you can say, see there that I've made lots of very distinct points, so I'm going to hit those four marks quite easily. Microorganisms cause infections. The human body has many ways of defending itself against microorganisms. Describe two ways the body prevents the entry of microorganisms. You have lots of options here. Remember that skin acts as a barrier, one mark. You can talk about the fact that the hydrochloric acid inside the stomach destroys pathogens for a second mark. You can say that cilia in the trachea waft and trap the bacteria and waft them up into the throat so they can be swallowed to be destroyed by stomach acid. You can talk about hairs in the nose trapping pathogens. Lots and lots of options. Right, I'm going to stop there. I hope you found it helpful, guys. Don't forget, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to know about when my next video will be uploaded. Take care, bye.